Welcome to Growing Up in Easton. Today is March 26th, 2021, and I am Priscilla Almquist Olson. It gives me a great deal of pleasure uh, to welcome my younger brother, I tend to say kid brother, Freddie Almquist of Orland, Maine, and his dear best buddy, Sean Fitzgerald, both classmates, 1967 at Alvern High School. So welcome, Sean. Welcome, Fred. Thank you. Thank you. So Good to be here. It is, and look what you're doing. Sean is putting up photos of Easton um, to remind us about where we grew up. So let's go. So tell me, um, John, let's start with you. What do you remember most about growing up in Easton? Well, I, I belong to a very tight group of friends and uh, most of it was around the school, schools uh, and quite a bit of change while we were, when we were young. Um, we, I, I moved to Easton in 1958 in the fourth grade um, and attended the Northeastern Grammar School. Across the street from the Northeastern Grammar School was um, O'Connor's uh, News Store. Hmm? O'Connor's News Store. O'Connor's News Stand, exactly. And I was a patrol boy there, um, held out my arms across Main Street to help kids cross the street when they came to school in the morning and when they uh, left after, after class. But uh, one of the most fun things was the kid on one side of the street would turn in one direction and I'd turn in the other direction and yell all in. And that meant it was time for the, for the, uh, in the morning for the other patrol boys to come back to school to attend class. And then that person who I yelled all into would yell it uh, another hundred yards and then another hundred yards and we'd all come in. And um, that Freddie was, Freddie was a, a, Patrol boy on the corner of where were you? Williams and where was it? All the memory, huh? Howland Court. Howland Court, exactly. And Wayne, and Wayne was on Jenny Lynn. Wayne Lundgren was on Jenny Lynn Street. Yes. We were at the end of the line, so we didn't get to yell all in. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what, Freddie? What a coincidence. I was a patrol girl at. Um, uh, it wasn't Holland Court. It was just opposite Jenny Lynn Street on Williams. That's what so I was. You know, they kept it in but, the family. Sean, you got to tell tell people what a patrol boy was. Well, a patrol boy was was a kid who who held out his arms so the people could cross the street. Right, crossing guard. Crossing guard. Yes, yeah, a new word for it. And every morning there was a uh, there was a police officer standing there with us. Uh, every day, I, he's standing with me because I was on Main Street, and um, I, I think I was well behaved. But perhaps they were trying to um, make me behave better. Um, but one of the funniest times ever was one of the kids at the end of the line didn't hear all in. <laughs> School started at eight o'clock, I think, and he didn't get there until almost nine. Finally, figured out all in had, had been called, and he had missed it. He was down at the library, wasn't he? Yes, he was, the furthest, yeah. furthest distance away. It wasn't uh, Dale Fitzgibbons, was it? It wasn't, and I'm not going to name names. Okay. But oh, go, um, ahead. go ahead, Freddie. No, go ahead. Well, he's, he's you know, he, that's on my notes also, patrol boy at Eastern Grammar School. It's one because you were part of the chosen few, you know, and, and you know, there was, I, there was, Decudo, Paul Decudo, Paul Anderson. Uh, I think, uh, I'm not sure if Peter Paulino was in there. Probably. Uh, Jimmy Hall, I think. Uh, yeah. You know, and just, it was, a, it was one of those honors that you received as a fifth grader. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what was that honor based on? Was it academics? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> nope. <laughs> Well, maybe, no. maybe, maybe for Sean it was, but it certainly wasn't for me. Oh, you didn't follow in your big sister's no. footsteps. I think a lot of it could also depend on where you lived. See, Wayne and I were down that end of town. So 
we ended up with the William Street Patrol. That's what we, you know, that was our neighborhood. So I think that's how we were chosen. So when you guys got a little older, um, Eleanor, let's talk about what you did when you were, say, 10 years old. You were in fifth grade. Do you have any memories about that? Who's either one? Yeah, either one. Um, the grammar school of Shantza, across from O'Connor's, which was famous, which is now a restaurant of some renown, is it not? Yes, um, the farmer's daughter. Yes, the farmer's daughter. Yeah, and, but this will, Sean will remember this place. Do you remember the white bench? Oh, yes. Well, I never got to sit on it, but oh, I, I, oh, I didn't. I, I did one time, the white bench, and Miss McFadden had a thing was called, well, her, one of her punishments was called the rat tan. If you remember that? Mm. I, that too. My mother was a school teacher, so I did not get in trouble. In, in, uh, in <laughs> well, it only took one time to see Miss McFadden on the white bench. And that sort of cured the, the deal because she had this, it was an 18 inch maple ruler and you would hold your hands out, knuckles up. Yep. It only took one, one correction. That sort of put you on the straight and narrow. Ms. Well, Freddie, as a, as a retired school teacher, would you, ever be able, would you have ever been able to do the same thing for your students? Oh, never touched them. Never touched them. No, 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 no. That was not. They're, that was not. they're illegal. I mean, there, there are laws now against that. As That's really abuse. And Ms. McFadden could have been arrested today. <laughs> well, um, corporal punishment was when I first started teaching was not illegal, but since then, yes, mm. it has been outlawed. So, what kind of escapades did you guys do together? Well, Sean said in the he came in the fourth grade, so and he lived over on Spooner Street, was kind of like you know the other side of town. So you 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 tended to hang at those ages with the kids in your neighborhood. And uh, for Sean and I, was it, it, we really became friends later on in, in school. Would you agree? Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, so, wasn't your best buddy Wayne Lundgren, who sadly passed away um, oh, oh, sure. four and a half years ago? Also known as Huggo. He, uh, he and I, were, we were brothers, inseparable. And we did, in those early years, uh, and right up through high school, we were... We like, you know, hand in glove. We did everything together. Um, I've often said, you've heard me say this, if, if our mothers uh, would be probably in jail for neglect today, <laughs> if, if they, they let their, their kids do what we were allowed to do. And we had such, I get you, like you said, freedom to go wherever we wanted to. They, and they trusted us to do that, which was amazing. For somebody who was like 10 years old, 11, 12, we'd, we'd, Wayne and I would ride our bicycles to Brockton over to DW Field Park, down to Center School. Um, and we were outdoors all the time. We got home from school, was outdoors. Uh, hated rainy days. Rainy days were just, you just, you know, you had to invent something to do. Much more difficult. But you no, know, yeah, Wayne and I were the best of buddies forever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Sean, did you have a best buddy forever um, during grammar school? I don't think I did have a best buddy in, in grammar school. Um, it, my closest friends became close friends well, actually well after high school, uh, after college even. Freddie became, Freddie and I became really close, um, high school, college, and, and thereafter. And then um, I moved away. I was in, I lived in Somerville, Houston, Dallas, Newton, and then came back to Easton and uh, got real close with a number of friends who were still in town um, from that point on. But um, it's interesting, Fred said that uh, I lived on the other side of town. Well, for <laughs> us, the other side of town was about a quarter of a mile away. And many of the kids we went to high school with, um, you know, they lived at Five Corners or Eastondale um, which we had no idea where most of those places were. That, that was the other end of the world to us. Um, this place without sidewalks, and in some cases still is.
but um, we, I mean, we just, we just had everything. We're so lucky growing up. Um, and I, I, Fred was a great basketball player. I was not, but a lot of what went on centered around basketball. So there were in junior high school, there were four uh, teams, two of them, which can you see the background now? Is the background okay. showing? Yes. I okay. That's the Catholic church and yes. the, uh, the Immaculate Conception Catholic church before um, Holy Cross was built. And then there were two Catholic teams, the souls and the saints. And then there were two Swedish teams, essentially the Lutherans, the Luthers represented by the Lutheran church or representing the Lutheran church. And then the Congos representing the congregational uh, church. And I think if I'm clever here, I can find, um, this was the old Lutheran church on, the, no, I'm sorry. No. That, I don't know, we, I don't even know what that was. That's the Methodist, the old Methodist church on Mechanic. All right, yes, yeah, so on Mechanic Street. And then very close to that Williams was, and Jenny, Williams and Jenny this was the Lutheran church. It's now, I believe, a two-family house. Uh, and then there was the Congregational Church, which is now, well, it was the township. I'm um, Cofinio? No. Uh, La Cucina, a restaurant downtown. Mm-hmm. And uh, all, all these things are like so old to us, but they were, they were brand new to, um, to us back then. Um, the, the children's museum was the fire station. There were three fire stations, but this was the one that served Northeastern. And then there were, there were four schools in addition to the Northeastern grammar school where we went, there was the Unionville school, the Eastendale school, um, the Furnace Village school. I guess there were three others. And I've got pictures of those too. I, I had a chance this morning to either take an extra time to shave and clean up or go take photos of these places. So I, I chose the photos, but um, uh, we, what is, what is now um, elderly apart, or over 55 apartments on Lincoln street. That was our junior high school. It was the original Oliver Ames high school. And when we went there in junior high school, we were there for six, seven, eight, and nine grades. And that was because all those schools that I just mentioned were being shut down and they were building the Parkview school. And until Parkview was done, there was no place for younger kids to go except the existing schools, which were those, and I believe the center school. And then, oh, which by the way, most, the center school is about to come down and I think Parkview is coming down to build one massive uh, elementary school. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the stories I heard much later after I, well, after I uh, graduated from high school was the story about the third grade massacre. Um, there were, there were kids who were lined up at the end of third grade and, and, and every, you know, step forward, step forward, step forward. Okay. The rest of you are going to the fourth grade. (laughs) It was, it was a tough time back then for someone who didn't make, make the grades. Um, and, um, you know, we all adjusted to it. We all survived it. Um, but fortunately, I didn't have to survive it. I didn't move there until the fourth grade. But then being in what's, what was the middle school then, we were there for four years. And, and it made our life a whole lot easier because seventh and eighth grade is really tough. When you come in as a seventh grader, you're the youngest kid in the, in the school. And when you leave as an eighth grader, you're the oldest kid in the school. So eighth, seventh graders get picked on pretty tough by eighth graders, but we were there six, seven, eight, nine. And um, yes, we were the youngest, but we had time to adjust seventh grade, time to adjust eighth grade. And when we were in ninth grade, we were king of the hill. Um, and it was, that was a great school. Um, Fred and I were talking about uh, the gymnasium, some of the things that took place there. One was, um, well, we had these dances and um, 
all the boys would line up on one side and all the girls on the other side. And it was really tough to get anybody to go out and dance. You had to walk all the way across the gymnasium to ask a girl to dance. So they do snowballs where uh, one couple would start dancing and then they'd stop the music and each person would have to go and get somebody else. So now you got two couples on the dance floor. And then they stop the music again and say snowball. And there were four couples and eight couples. And it was great fun. And then the other thing that happened in, uh, in that auditorium, or, well, it was. It was an auditorium and a gymnasium. Um, we'd have these, these uh, what were they called? Well, they, they were celebrations of things like Memorial Day, Veterans Day. And there was this kid in our class, Bill Dexter, who was... I mean, he, well, he still makes a living as a musician. He, he was just a beautiful trumpeter. And he would play taps on Memorial Day and uh, um, Veterans Day, just perfectly, so smoothly. And then this other kid was in, in the back of the building in the stairwell, and he was supposed to play the echo. And it didn't go particularly well. Then he had to walk back to the front of the school. He was a redheaded kid with freckles, and his when he when he was embarrassed, the the redness was so red it was pretty incredible. But I mean, that's one of those things we we remember just just forever. Mm -hmm. Was Mrs. Frothingham uh, alive then, Freddie? Because yes. she, okay, um, that I don't know. Mrs. Parker was. I'm not sure what Mrs. Frothingham. Well, in that gymnasium, in that gymnasium, we had uh, just the Northeastern kids. Every Christmas, um, we all went there. Girls on came up on the stage on one side, boys on the other. She was in the middle. On each side of her was a Santa Claus with a huge sack of toys. And the girls would all get the same gift and the boys would get the same gift. Mm -hmm. And then when, we, when Santa gave us our gift, we would then turn and shake hands and thank uh, Mary Frothingham for the, the, and you know she was doing that when our mother was right. in grade school. So. That did not happen for us. No. Okay, but she the, must. Have, she must have passed, I guess. Okay, so Freddie. Um, well, I'll give you a highlight. Sean will remember. In terms of, uh, although maybe not, because this was when we were like in again grammar school, but a fellow by the name of Paul Matrano. He owned the local car deal, Chevy dealership right in the middle of town. Right next to the right next to the grammar school, and if people can believe this today, that are not from Easton, or back in that era, he would take five hundred kids, the first five hundred to the the dealership, first five hundred kids go to a Red Sox game. He'd take he because he had the school bus contract, so he had the buses. He'd load up like twelve buses of. 500 kids or whatever, and he would buy our ticket. He would get us a um, bag of peanuts, hot dog, ice cream, and a soda. And that was, and did that every summer. It was, it was truly a highlight, except for the 100 bottles of beer on the wall song. And somebody would obviously stop. Beat me to it. <laughs> <laughs> then somebody would start and have to finish. But it was, it was truly, and Paul Matrano, talk about magnanimous. It was incredible. To find somebody to do that, and you think about in this day and age what that would cost somebody to do today. And again, I guess you know you go back and it's it's relative. It was it was not cheap, you know. So he really he really he he showed a lot of kids the Red Sox. Paul did. Yeah, he was a wonderful man, very yeah. generous, and so many people have commented on on his generosity and those Red Sox games, Fred. Um, so. Um, did you have a bike, Sean? I mean, did you ride around on a bike too? I did have a bike. I mean, everyone had a bike, but um, we mostly didn't have to ride a bike too much of anywhere. I, I was less, clearly less than a quarter of a mile from Frothingham Park, where everything took place. Um, and Frothingham Park is actually bigger today than it was back then, but we did everything there. Um, and as long as we were home by the time the streetlights came on, we were fine. Um, I, we had we had no fear. Um, you, you know, very peaceful 
uh, environment back then. And um, we, we, we were just in great shape. Uh, <clears throat> weren't the, weren't the, uh, the rings, they were really dangerous. I mean, they would never have those rings today. Correct. They wouldn't build those rings today, but we had so much fun on the on the rings and the and the merry-go-round. And there was another thing that was kind of like a merry-go-round. It had um, had chains hanging off it with like a, a, a ladder hold, and we could we could flip a little kid about a hundred feet in the air by by wrapping one one chain around all the others. Um, it was it was a really good time. Yeah. And then, of course, there were tennis courts. They were always full. The basketball court, people came from cities and towns all around to, to play basketball there because they knew it was about the basque, best basketball around. And, um, well, uh, pretty darn good football back then, too. Uh, all Rames won the state championship, Class D, in 1965. And Freddie's team in 1967 uh, lost in the Boston Garden uh, state championship. Freddie missed a shot. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if, our, if our good friend Mikey McGuire was still here, he would say, well, you know, I should have told Muzzy to put in Billy Dexter <laughs> instead of me. <laughs> That's Mike always yeah. used to tease me about that. And, and, speaking, and Mike McGuire. Mikey, go ahead. Of Mikey, yeah, speaking of Mikey. You know, when you, you, you know, not until you're really an adult, do you really look back on some of the kids and you, you just say, he was, he was, you know, because he was the most courageous person I think I've ever known in my life, Mikey McGuire. And at the time, you know, as a kid, you just don't appreciate it, you know, because um, one of the things I can still remember back in, in the mid 50s, it, it relates to today, is that talked about vaccinations. We were all lined up downstairs in the, in the basement of the Northeastern Grammar School, lined up for our polio vaccine, which was every parent's, you know, every parent's fear at that time. But we didn't know. We were all standing down there crying. Everybody's, everybody's in line crying because they're going to get a shot. And, uh, but Mike was one, you know, unfortunately for Mike, you know, it, he, he, he got afflicted with the polio. And, and, I just look back at Mike and say, what, what, a, what a courageous person he, he was. He's just amazing. And what, he's, what he did, you know, just throughout his life. He was really- a, He also, Freddie, have a great sense of humor. Oh, you think? Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, believe me, we were, the yeah, butt he, of more, we were the butt of more jokes than you can imagine, Mike. Yes. Yeah, it, it's actually Mike's wife who gave me this this morning. Yes. <laughs> and, um, he, he has as many letters as the very best athletes in all of, all of Rames history. He was the equipment manager for four sports for, for three years. So he has 12 varsity letters, including the varsity letter for the football team in 1960. Um, and then the varsity letter for, um, for the runner up basketball team in 1967. Um, went on to be a, uh, I guess you call it social scientists. He uh, went to Bridgewater State, and he worked at the uh, the prison in um, in Bridgewater. He did intake for all the criminals to evaluate their mental health. Some of the stories he would tell were just unbelievable. He couldn't tell names, but he could tell stories. It's so Pretty sad. Guy. It's so sad that Mike is no longer with us. Um, because he has, he made contributions and memories for everybody he came in touch with. Absolutely. And his parents were told that he wouldn't make it out of elementary school. And he lived to be 68. And in, the, in, that, in that time, he survived a, a couple of uh, automobile accidents. And at, near the end of his life, um, uh, cancer and a couple of broken arms because he fell. Uh, he, you know, he, he was on crutches his whole life, or the whole life, the whole time I knew him, fell a couple of times and slow healing. But as Fred said, courageous and very, very good attitude all the time. Mm. So he was a great role model for all of you. He was. Junior, high, yes. junior high, a couple of highlights. I mean, highlight and one was a low light, but I can remember, um, and I, who was, Sean, who was my sixth grade teacher? 
Miss Miss Smith, Mrs. Smith. Was it Mrs. Smith? It may have been. Uh, so, old lady, glasses, front, front room. I, <laughs> when well, when I, you're in the sixth grade, they're all old ladies. I know. Well, they she brought in. This was, but in those days, she brought in her own television set, so we could watch Alan Shepard go into space, be the first American to launch into space. And we were one of the only classes in the whole school that had that. And it was like one of those unforgettable moments, you know, in, in terms of your, you know, history of history of, the, of our country. And, and she brought that in, it was really a highlight. And then, of course, you know, because nobody had televisions in those days. And I think it was in eighth grade in that same building, uh, the yellow building on Lincoln Street, that um, Jack Kennedy was assassinated. So at about, at about noon, um, well, the, in, in between two of the science classrooms, there was a lab. There was a, we were in ninth grade. We were in ninth grade. There was, uh, there was a building, there was a room where they kept all the uh, chemicals and beakers and flasks and all that sort of thing. And, and one of the two TVs in the whole school. It, exactly. And the teachers were in that room with the TV. And what's going on? What's going on? We were trying to figure it out. And, and we had a dance that afternoon. It was a Friday. And um, they, they canceled the dance and sent us home telling us of the news of uh, his assassination. Um, one, of, one of the saddest days of many people's lives. Mm. One of mine, yeah. I think we all remember where we were when we heard exactly. that news. Mm. Yeah, I had the uh, privilege of uh, going down to Washington, D.C. because I was a student uh, in New Jersey at that time, and my uh, uh, B husband and I went down there, and we were just close to the Capitol doors with his lying in state when they shut the doors so we couldn't get in and pay our respects. The next day, we we saw the um, you know the the hearse. It, it was really a horse, a riderless horse, and um, what do you call that when they're on the- Stirrup, the stirrup was turned backwards. Yes, but, he, but the, the coffin was on a, on a wagon. And it caisson. Was a very, caisson, yep. And it was, I'll never forget it. I was um, uh, on the street as, as he was brought to uh, the church. Yeah. Anyway, so Freddie. Um, yeah. Tell us another one of your so-called uh, unspeakable ventures. Ventures. Oh, Wayne. Oh, you. Well, I, I have. Yeah, I've, I've told you this before, so you know where I'm going to go with this one. We were Wayne liked to bowl, so we go to Crescent Lane, which is over in Brockton, and our mothers would give us 25 cents for the bus. You know, a round trip from from down at the bottom of Seaver Street over to Brockton back for 25 cents. So we get down to the bottom of Seaver. Now we're 11 years old, 12 maybe. We get down there, and of course, it probably was my idea. And I'd say to Wayne, "Hey, why don't we save the quarter and we'll hitchhike a ride over?" And we did that multiple times. And I'm telling you, it was a couple times, and we hitched back. This old, I'm thinking today, which I wouldn't even. Oh my! That would be like, like I said, wow. So there was, it was, it was a different time. You could trust people, um, you know, and it was a, a wonderful neighborhood. Um, our neighborhood, as you know, Priscilla, the, we were fortunate to uh, live on the dead end street of Seba Street, and all of the land from our house to Washington Street, the clock barn, all the land behind our house from down to all the way to, um, to Short Street in Southeastern was, was all woods, was all our playground. And we'd go down there, we'd play army out on the, now is the cheap pasture. Uh, we'd go to the meadows, the meadows for, for ice skating down at the potato, potato cellar. Um, it was just an incredible place to grow up. Um, and uh, uh, I just, it was such a, a fortunate area to live in. And all the kids in the neighborhood got along quite well. We really did. Uh, we had, you know, the Pickerings, the Leonards, the Styrenes, the Barrys. You go right around like Gary Olson, the Olsons. And, and just, it was uh, quite a neighborhood we lived in. We were, very for, we were very fortunate to be there. And it was very quiet, of course. It was a dead end street. Beautiful place. Uh, did you go through the woods to the left of our house 
to the opening. This, you know, that's where the old dump used to be. Yeah. Um, would, you, would you go and play baseball there? Because we set yeah. up. A oh, down back, we call it the field. Oh, yeah, we field. Kind of we cut our own baseball, the Pickering boys, and, and they were the leaders of it. They we cut our own baseball diamond out of the field there. Played baseball all the time down there. It was really, it was, <clears throat> it was the Aussie and Harriet, you know, type experience. It really was. It just amazing. And uh, couldn't say anything. It was, Easton was such a wonderful place to grow up. Really was. Yeah. And, I had, and I'd be remiss, like Sean was saying, get into basketball daddy daddy and Kyle Hansen were instrumental in starting that church league back in the day where everybody played in and people did that everybody in the community got together and they they volunteered to there were no recreation departments it was all the parents that did little league Normie Cronin was my my uh my little league coach um you know it's it was an amazing time and um I, I'd be remiss you know of course in high school like Sean said, we play basketball. I had mentors there, and I, I just have to mention them because it, when it comes to uh, athletics, it was a big part of my life. Um, Val Val Moscato was obviously he was the 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 motivator, but and but I, I owe my basketball career to Bill Nixon who was my halfway through my senior year taught me how to shoot a one hand jump shot. And Bill, if you'll ever listen to this, I'm not sure. Cause after that, I wanted the ball. <laughs> I wanted the ball, give me the ball, I want to shoot it. And, and went on to Gorham State College and had a wonderful basketball career there. All owe it to Bill Nixon. I really do. You know, it was an incredible teacher. He taught <clears> me how to, how to play really the, the finer points of basketball. Well, Freddie, you'll be happy to know that, that uh, Bill Nixon is still with us. I know it. Sean told me that, and <clears throat> and then in high school, but and I think I think Sean will will also when you have mentors as far as fellow students, you don't see that happen a lot today. But Tommy Clay was truly a mentor to a lot of us in school. He was our captain of the basketball team, but he was so far ahead of himself. He's mature for his years, and. He, he convinced all of us, oh, you want to go to college? So you should try to get into every club you can because colleges look at that, not just your grades. If you go to my yearbook, which of course I did, I pulled the yearbook out. You look at all of the clubs that we were all in. Huh, Sean? We were in the Glee Club. We were in, the, we were in the, um, the French Club, the Math Club, the Library Club. Imagine, Sean and I were librarians. You think that over. So... <laughs> Can't believe it. Oh, we, I was a made-up uh, Spanish t speaker. That's right. And but, but in Tommy, French, but Tommy was the guy that. But when you agree, he was the guy that really was leading us to a lot of these, you know, these decisions that we made. And he was truly, a, a really, you know, a student leader. He really was. And yeah, he went on. He went on to one of our one of our, one of our highlights. One of our highlights was and was was guys and dolls. I can we can and. Sean and I sang the open act. Think that over. <laughs> Tommy's father told him that he that he if he wanted to play basketball on the varsity team, he had to either join the glee club or join the band. And he's walking home um, actually with the same kid who missed the all-in signal. Said, ah, I have to join the glee club or the band. And this kid says, "We'll all join." And then all of a sudden, Mrs. Ashley, who was the, the music teacher at the time, just, she got so excited. First time where she had probably 15 male voices that so she could do guys and dolls. Now they had to, they had to change the names of some of the uh, uh, venues in, in guys and dolls, change some of the words here and there, but we had a blast. We did, sold the place out two nights. Yeah. It was a sellout for two nights. The auditorium. We were stars. Yeah. You know, you know, it's amazing. Um, you say that Tommy Clay was years ahead of himself because he went on to medical school and became, I think, a surgeon. Univer University of Vermont. He went on and he played basketball at the University of Vermont, and uh, he gave it up uh, to study for his for you know for his medical studies. He gave up basketball. 
Yeah. At, at, exactly. Yeah. Mm. yeah. No, he. Uh, and my other guy, the other guy that I haven't mentioned in this thing, is as far as you know, because Wayne was my brother, and and and, and Sean has become one. But Paul Anderson was, you see, when I, I, it must have been in every teacher's training, training, you know, regimen that whenever kids came into class, you always sat them alphabetically. And so it probably was a good thing because I was always, and by your last name, I was always sitting in the first row for a seat. And invariably on most classes, Paul Anderson sat right behind me for most of my junior high, high school career at times. And for both of us, it probably wasn't a good thing. You know, it really wasn't. But Paul and I got along well. And then he talked me into running, going for track, went out for track as a junior. And, and he and I had a great time as high jumpers and, and hurdlers. And we went on, had, had, we won the Belmont relays and the Falmouth relays, um, Hockamock, because undefeated Hockamock League and uh, but uh, there was you know there were times when he wasn't behind me which was which that's when my great one I remember Alice Belay was behind me one a couple of classes <laughs> and thankfully that's when my grades went up in that class what a surprise you know because Alice was a fantastic student she was one of our best and uh, so that little bit of that rubbed off but uh, you know there were folks as you go through you know a lifetime that in, in, in those times it's in school and in early years that really that really stand out and uh, they're, they're just wonderful memories. Well, uh, before, before we got going here, I, I was playing with these photos that I took this morning. And um, this one is a picture of uh, Tom Mailoff's house. Tom Mailoff owned probably 25 or 30 acres of land and another 50 of a pond called Flyaway Pond. Um, that whole area is now a subdivision, Flyaway Pond. And um, some of the dry land was where the Boy Scouts used to get together every, I think we went in the spring. Uh, and then on the pond was, um, across the pond was Pout Rock. And that's where you could go out and swim. Um, Flyaway Pond was pretty shallow, so it warmed up pretty quickly. It got weedy in the summer, but we would go swimming there in May. We'd, we'd walk through the woods. We'd go right past the town pool to get there. Um, we'd walk through the woods, and then we'd walk along this earthen dam out to Pout Rock and swim. Um, the earthen dam had two, uh, two dams, uh, sluiceways. One of them was built by the Ameses to, to run the uh, shovel shop probably a hundred and some years ago. And the other was engineered and rebuilt by the Army Corps of Engineers. So our freshman year in college, so 1968, that the, the brand new Corps of Engineers dam broke and all the water from Flyaway Pond went through the woods for almost a mile and knocked down a, a stone wall in between the Ames Free Library and uh, what was the carriage house for the Queensland House, uh, and did I mean did real devastation downtown Easton. Um, that that dam was never rebuilt, um, and the land is now owned by. Um, but we had a blast at Flyaway Pond, and and we also had a blast at Shovel Shop Plant uh, Pond, uh, not swimming but ice skating. And somewhere I've got a picture of um, Fred's Pond or, or um, uh, what's it called? Langwater. Langwater Pond. And we would shovel off the snow and skate there every year. Um, and then when we got to high school, no, junior high school, we would go to, uh, where school. was it? The center hmm? school. No, no. No, we got picked up at uh, what then was, uh, uh, where is it? Well, it's, it's down to, hmm? it's called Senior. Borgeson's now. No, it's not even that. Anyway, we'd all meet in front of the gas station and we'd get in cars 
to play ice hockey, we'd, we'd drive down to Tabor, Tabor Academy. They had an outdoor rink. And I mean, they made up four teams, I think. The, uh, the Hawks, the Bears, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, but it was amazing. We, we would skate as soon as we possibly could. There were swamps behind um, what is now the middle school. I think that was called Manny Morgan's. There was, there was a swamp behind uh, uh, Western Ave, and that was called the Floods. And I mean, the, the water was only a foot deep, so it would, it would freeze very, very early. We were out there skating as soon as we possibly could. Western Ave, by the way, that was, that was the Chestnut Knoll of the 1950s and 60s. All the homes built on Western Ave, Harrison Ave, et cetera. Um, that was the place. If you had arrived, you, you lived in off Western Ave. Uh, yes, and I, I think that, John, I think that's because Easton was really a, a working class. Oh, community. absolutely. And, and um, you and, um, and Freddie are the first generation to go to college, I would think. Oh, no, your dad, though, was a college professor, right? Right, right. We moved to Easton so that he could teach at Bridgewater State. Yeah. I see. And um, for most of us, uh, we're the first generation that went to college. So our parents were uh, working. Um, Fred, and my father, was a, a lineman for Brockton Edison. My mother was a, a house, house um, wife and started a catering company because she knew that she, family needed money to send us to college. Yeah. So she had a wonderful catering business, was a wonderful cook and baker, um, and did everything out of our little kitchen. Amazing. Well, so, I think that um, I think we moved to Easton because we could afford it. Uh, it was 1958, and the shovel shop shut down in 1956, I believe. So, um, you know, somewhere we could could afford. And my mother was from Stoughton. My father was from Abington. And um, Easton was a nice town. Um, and it, it, the, the Easton we grew up in had sidewalks. You know, a, lot of, a lot of the rest of the community didn't. We had sidewalks. We had the parks. We had the school. It was a mile to to the furthest distance away for, you know, for everything, school, park, um, banks, post office. Um, and, and, and the, the buildings were so beautiful too. Um, so my, my, I, we didn't have two nickels to rub together after my father passed away. And I got an early job here at, um, this is, was on the left-hand side of this building was the post office. I was the special delivery boy. I'd get there probably at 645 to pick out any special delivery mail and, and deliver it on my bike. I did have a bike <laughs> um, and get to school by 730 or eight, whatever time we stopped. And then on, on the, uh, on the right-hand side of this building was the Northeastern Savings Bank which moved there when we were seniors, I believe, because, and we know that for sure, because um, your father taped all of the, um, the WBET uh, radio uh, station following the, uh, the, high, the high school basketball season. My sister, Karen, did that. Oh, it was it Karen? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Really? I didn't oh, know. yes. Yeah, so so you know, and 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 join us at our new facility on two seventy five Main Street or whatever the name was. And to us, you know, that was that was the uh, the Northeastern Savings Bank. And then similarly, uh, this was the original Eastern Cooperative Bank. Yes, which is now where a barber shop is, and there's apartments up above. And then the Eastern Cooperative Bank moved to what was then um, the telephone company central office. And now, of course, they have a couple of other locations. But um, we saw so much change. Um, when, when we graduated from high school, I think there were 8,000 people in Easton. And now there's maybe 26, 27,000 people. Do you remember 
and we were talking the banks, and I've, I've mentioned this it would be a great thing to start again today, but Northeastern Cooperative Bank in, in, in grammar school and up into junior high, they open, you could open up your own savings account and you could bring your pennies and nickels and dimes in a little envelope every, like every Monday morning and you'd have to seal it all up with your name on it. And you had a passbook and your teacher would, would, you know, the bank would come and collect all that. And so they were, it was really a neat process of teaching kids how to save for the future. And I mean, we just, I, would, I could just remember, it was just saving pennies. They would take whatever and the bank, but the bank was really, I thought that's a really good smart marketing ploy on the bank's part for future customers because the kids are going to grow up. And where do you have your savings account? I'm wondering why banks and things like that, why would they might not do that again today it would be a good idea. But you know, back and, the, and the um, cooperative bank became the Bank of Easton. And one other little note, uh, antidote, Fred, our grandfather, our mother's father, Sander Larson, was on the first board of directors of the cooperative yeah. bank. And I had heard that from, from Mama all the time. And I asked the president some years ago, 10, 15 years ago, I asked him, um, is it true? And he looked up the records, and yes, it was true. Sander Larson, mm -hmm. our grandfather, was on the first board of directors. And he came over from Sweden and worked in the shovel shop. He, he, was, he made shovels. He was a working class man. And I think that showed a lot of respect uh, for the working class. Uh, uh, his father was a, a rather rich farmer in Sweden and became the judge, not because he went to law school, but because they always took the smartest man, not woman, of course, the smartest man in that region and made him the judge. So Sander grew up with community responsibility, civic uh, pride and so forth. So Ed Hans told me something I didn't know, Freddie, was he started um, English classes for Swedes. Mm -hmm. He also formed, and I know you won't agree with this, Fred, no you, Sean, but he started the uh, Hu Templar, which is Swedish for a temperance society. Sweet. There you go. We can hold ourselves back. We really can. We can. <laughs> <laughs> one, of, one of the other things we did, I got a picture in my background now of um, the baseball field. Um, when, when we were growing up, there was one baseball field up there on Lincoln Street. I think it's called Militia Park now. One, one field for the entire Little League. And somehow they worked it out so that, uh, you know, the, the kids could play on their father's team and, um, and everybody could make it to the game on the right day at the right time. Um, and most of us walked or rode our bikes to that field as well. Yeah. We were, we were lucky. We were blessed. Now, when you mentioned those tapes, uh, you go down Main Street and you can start thinking about those places. Like one that comes to mind, uh, like we had Harvey's Market, remember Harvey's Market in the corner, mechanic, and across Ing's Kitchen was a sponsor of, they would, they would sponsor those, those broadcasts of uh, the tech tourney games in, in, uh, when we were playing basketball and all those, all those you know. I have to review those again sometimes. See who else were the sponsors. But O'Connor's News Store, the Penny Candy. These are highlights, you know. Amazing. Amazing. Oh, and we could go into the Eastern Pharmacy or Abbott's Pharmacy and get a Cherry Coke, a Vanilla Coke. I mean, it was it was a true. Oh, that was uh, O'Connor's. So we, uh, we invented, if you remember, we invented Vanilla Cokes. <laughs> 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 and they came out later with. I said, no, oh, no. We should have got some royalties for that because we used to have O'Connor's vanilla cokes. Yep. And I, I want to tell you that place you walk in and the the floorboards were like yeah. <laughs> two by sixes. That mean it, you you the knots stood up high and everywhere else was worn away. It yeah. wasn't like everything was yeah. spotless sanitary. Candy bars. Same with um, McBenemy's hamburgers out on Route 138. Yeah. That place. You know, they, they would grind the meat just before they made your hamburger. It was a tremendous place. But you could get candy bars for a nickel, ice cream cone for a dime. Yep. 
Popsicle and the Christmas tree popsicle. for a dollar. Uh, somewhere for here I, I, on Columbus Avenue, which was the next street from where I grew up, um, was the, the corner store. Mm -hmm. And it's the same yeah. basic land as where the 7-Eleven is now. But the corner store was just a shack. And that place was so packed with, with, with stuff. Um, loved it. Loved it. Yeah. Yeah. And so just I think stuff. I went there. Just, I think I went there the night before Christmas, you know, like a, a day before Christmas Eve to get a Christmas tree. Like I said, we didn't have much money. Um, and he said, you can have any tree out there for a dollar. It was he was all done selling them and he knew I didn't have any money. I, I picked out a tree that was like 10 feet tall and brought it home to my house with, with seven foot ceilings yeah. and dragged it back. And he let me take another one. Yeah. God, Dick Southworth, great Dick guy. Dick Southworth, yeah. 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 He was yeah. famous. Exactly. Yeah. And you were going to say something about the corner store? Oh, me? Oh, just, you know, oh. yeah, it was, it was, it was a it was a nickel for a candy bar. You could get uh, squirrel nut bars and, and wow. mint juleps. Those were my favorites. Two Same for here. a penny. Now yeah. they're like I think they're a dime each. They don't make squirrel nut bars anymore. Probably not. They, they no, probably not. not environmentally sensitive or something. <laughs> <laughs> and I see that uh, behind you is the uh, the old police station. Yes. Yeah. And with the one cell. It and, had one cell. Yep. And, um, uh, Were you ever in it? Uh, what was it? Uh, the, the night before uh, Halloween, Halloween night, I, I and probably 15 other guys narrowly avoided making it to the cell. Um, we had the, uh, the Halloween riot of 1966, I think it was. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You won't mention any names who... We won't mention any names. Well, so the the principal said that uh, that we couldn't go to the funeral of one of our classmates' parents, and somebody, a few people, went to his house and you know threw eggs or tomatoes or something like that. But then there was this guy in our class who was a little bit further down the road than eggs and and uh, tomatoes, and he put. Like concrete blocks under piles of leaves and squirted them with gasoline that night, started them on fire. They called the fire department. Um, fire department starts, starts putting out the, the fires and, the, the, and some kids threw tomatoes and, and eggs. So <laughs> the fire department <laughs> turned the hoses on everybody. And this guy was, you know, he was, he was at home. He ran his, we had no idea what was going on. He knew exactly what he had done. And um, they come along with a school bus and everyone who they, who didn't run basically ended up at the, uh, at the lockup here. The lockup. We, we didn't go in, we didn't go in the cell, but we were in the building. I and that ran. building had, um, it had a basement that had a, uh, uh, it, it, it was like a garage. But at the end of the basement, um, over my, over this, no, over this shoulder, there was a firing range underground that went from that building to Mechanic Street. That's at, at a practice yeah. range for them to, to, to shoot their pistols. Wow. <laughs> and I got to mention, I got to mention my boys, the, we were the four Swedes. I had in high school, we became the four Swedes. We had, it was, it was my cousin, Kyle Anderson, his cousin Roy Anderson, and of course Wayne Wayne Lundgren, and myself. We were the four Swedes, and uh, we had uh, we were again best buds, and we everybody you know got along so well in high school. I thought so, you know, you know. But uh, you always welcome in places like you know, uh, and um, the Lewises down in Southeastern, uh, Karen and Donna. Donna, right, Sean? Yep. Yep. I mean, they would host kids. Their, their, their parents were, <laughs> they hosted more kids in their basement than you can imagine. I mean, throughout high school. You know, so uh, as, as we went around, it was, you, you always could, you know, could hang out with all, all different kids through, through school. And 
and most most of everybody was pretty friendly. I thought. Fred, you know, um, our parents, mainly our mother, hosted all kinds of parties in the basement. Uh, I don't know if you remember. I was like 13, 14. So you would have been like six and seven. Um, people come up to me today and say, wow, we just loved it. You know, the record player was on, we called it the phonograph. And, um, my, and they also remembered my mother's menu. She always made chocolate cake with white frosting yeah. and um, potato chips and I think zero, uh, Xerox, what was that raspberry syrup that you bought and you mixed it with Xerox. 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 Oh. Right. Yep. And I'll tell you, uh, 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 a moment in high school, Priscilla, that I think Sean will relate to because I, he was, one, again, one of the chosen ones. But our high school put on a, a production called the Jim Jam every every two years. Yes. And um, it was every single kid in the school was put on by the physical education department. And we were one of, we were one of, I think at the time, three high schools in the state of Massachusetts where every kid had physical education class every single day. And the, the, the staff was, they put on this gym jam where every kid participated in some kind of physical activity and exercise and so on and, and a show at night. And the place was, you, you should have, it was amazing. It was sort of jammed, I mean, you know, no pun intended, but it was, the place was so packed because all the parents would come. And, and uh, if I'm not mistaken, Sean, were you one of the bamboo dancers? I was a bamboo dancer. Yeah, yes. see, so Sean was one of the chosen few. Yeah, he was. Well, he was, one of the unchosen few. It was originally chosen. Um, he's a good athlete. He was uh, in the clique, and um, he liked to mouth off to to uh, teachers, any anyone who came anywhere close to him. And with two weeks left, there was um, one of the female gym teachers had had enough. She says, "You're out of here." And he said, "You can't get rid of me." Two weeks before this, this is something that was practiced for the entire. Oh, yeah. Water for actually semester, I think, and um, and what it was if for anyone who's not familiar with it, it's um, it was four guys slapping bamboo poles together uh, in in a cross. So one on each end of two poles, and then um, two doing it uh, perpendicular, and then the dancers would st stick their toe in between the the slapped poles. After after they were pulled apart, and um, and then start dancing all around it. So it was, it was mostly athletes that got got involved in it, and I I was put on the uh, on the gym jam team um, oh, that you year. Were, you were, survived you it, but two years earlier, the gym jam team went to Ted Mac Amateur Hour. Was that the national yeah. published? Yeah, 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 yes, yeah. yeah, and that was uh, class of '65 as well. I think. Yeah. But uh, that was such a dangerous thing, and and people who viewed it, I mean, we were so spellbound. You want to see uh, just waiting for someone to get hurt seriously. Yeah. You want you want to see dangerous? If you're seeing Jimmy McDonald doing his his he was incredible uh, gymnast, and and well, he and the Casey boys, Wayne and Tom, they would they would do this vaulting off a, a mini tramp or a springboard over a stack of guys all stacked up on the, you remember this, Sean? Over oh, the, yeah. the top of the uh, wooden box. And they'd be, they'd be up there 10 or 12 feet and they would be vaulting over the diving over of these guys. And they were just they're truly, you know, again, incredible athleticism. But, you know, Hero Helene, go ahead, Sean, I'll give you the honor. Well, I, I was just going to say additional things that went on with the uh, the gym jam was there were kids who would climb the ropes that was and me. they would they would stand on the ropes with their arms out to both sides with the, the the rope wrapped around their body and around their legs and then they'd go upside down and do the same thing and people were spellbound. In addition to that, they had tableaus. So the the kids with the the most muscular body in most cases. Um, were painted silver and they do like Mount Suribachi with the raising of the, of the flag and um, you know a few historical things that had in had become 
uh, iconic statues. And, and the lights were shown on them just in such a way. They're painted silver, but they look like they were made of bronze. And it was, it was great. This guy, Iro Helene, was a, was a retired drill sergeant for the Army or the Marines, I think. Marines. Marine Corps. Marine Corps. Marines. Yeah. And, you know, uh, John Kennedy was, um, had, had been the, the president, and he had, had strongly encouraged um, the Marine Corps test exercises and that people be fit. So at the beginning of every single gym class for the first quarter, we would do five exercises. And um, they were squat thrusts, push-ups, pull-ups, sit-ups, and a 300-yard run with five, uh, five lengths of 60 yards. And at the end of the, the first quarter, there'd be town uh, school-wide competitions where someone would start squat thrusts in the first period. And after school, he was still doing his 2,000th uh, squat thrust. And, and kids doing 120 pull-ups and 200 sit-ups in two minutes. It was just incredible. And, you know, and, he, and everybody enjoyed it. He made such a game of it. And what was his motto? Be fit. Be fit. For honor's sake, be fit. Bam. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what we learned. Okay. How to, we actually, we actually learned how to ballroom dance. We had... Oh. We, all kinds of dancing. We're not, we, we, had, we all, because all the classes, that was the only one, the only class that was um, not segregated, male, female. No, all, there was also folk dancing. Well, yeah, the dance class. Yes, we had, yeah, yes, the dance right. classes were, right. were the only time, so they did separate the gym doors, the big divider doors, and we got to have a phys ed class with the girls. So that was kind of cool. And, and his entire perspective was, give you something, teach you something that you could do for the rest of your life for exercise. Yeah. And, and, you know, people ended up enjoying it. The other thing he did was he'd line us up on the, on the baseline of the basketball court um, by height at, uh, what was it dress, right dress? Was that what he, you were not a match. Toes 45 yeah. heels together, toes 45 and, um, and and we would move down so that we were perfectly aligned an elbow away from the next guy. One arm was down to your side, left arm was down to your side and the right arm was, elbow was up. So it just barely touched the, the kid next to you. So who is the instructor? Eero Helene. Yep. Yes. Guy. Oh, I remember him. He was Finnish. I think he came from Finland originally. Uh, yes, yeah. And he was in tremendous shape. Yes, he was. I remember him. Yeah. And then we had a junior high school teacher, gym teacher, Tom Crow. Crow. And talk about in shape. He was young. Yeah. And uh, like they had a uh, students against faculty softball team. Well, not just one game. He would throw people out at first base from left field yeah. and and if you were talking at the back of the study hall class he would throw a he would throw an eraser between your two heads and hit the wall behind it <laughs> discipline was pretty good back then so fred um thinking back and, and you obviously you and sean have shared all of these wonderful memories uh and you had mentioned the word freedom um what do you think uh, Easton taught you uh, that you took with you in your adult life and still feel. Uh, you broke up. Can you repeat that? You broke up. Oh, okay. Um, what qualities of Eastern life you experienced growing up carried with you to your, your adult life? What, what made certain things possible for you? Well, of course, I think it was a combination of uh, a variety of things, starting with my family. Family was always supportive, even you. <laughs> so it starts with the family, and and my mother and father had had direction taught us to work hard, to do the right thing, uh, to be compassionate. I think, and and 
And then as you got into schools, you know, the, the teachers were very, very good at, at, at um, um, their subject areas. One of my, again, mentors and, and fellow, uh, John Farrington, was the drafting instructor at the time at the high school. He's the one that inspired me to, to my teaching career. And that's what I wanted to do. Um, I could have gone to Wayne to be an electrical engineer at Northeastern. I, was, I had an acceptance there, but I knew I wasn't, first of all, I wasn't smart enough. <laughs> but secondly, I really, by the time I got through high school at that time, I knew I wanted to go teaching. And, and Mr. Farrington was, was the guy that inspired me. So you had, you had situations like that throughout the community where, you know, volunteerism, um, uh, uh, people looking out for each other, you know, it was just a, really it was a quintessential small town life that was, you know, it's just, I lived, it just was charming. It was just amazing. It was just an incredible place to be. I, I couldn't, couldn't have picked a better place to grow up than Eastern Massachusetts. Yeah, and um, you mentioned about how everybody was cared about each other. I can remember uh, parents scolding children of different parents, and those different parents appreciated it. Try try that today. You know, if if someone saw a kid doing something wrong, that adult would come over and well, it took a village. As it say, as they say, it takes a village, and right. and we had a great village. Yeah, you did. But I'm thinking also about the independence, Sean, that you described. Um, how, how what effect did that have on your life? Well, I, I, I honestly feel like I'm the luckiest person in the world. Um, everything has gone well for me. I, I, had, I had to work at a lot of things, but things went very well for me. Um, but, 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 you know, one of, the, one of the comments when Fred was talking earlier about the the white bench and the rattan and how you could never get away with that today back then you would not go home and tell your your parent the parents that um you got in trouble at school i certainly wouldn't um, i i avoided fights like you wouldn't believe i, I got a picture here somewhere of the uh, the uh saint mark's church and they used to have a fair every year in the in the in the fall and somebody started pushing me around and I, I didn't want to take it, but I did again, because my mother was a school teacher and I could not get in trouble with her. And it started, in, it started into a little fight and it was quickly broken up. I mean, parents were always around to, to take care of problems, whether it was ice hockey or little league or um, anything, ice skating on the ponds. There were always adults around just kind of watching out so that little fight was quickly broken up. And then Monday I walked into the, the boys room, I think it was eighth grade. Um, and the kid who had started the fight was in there with another kid and, you know, challenged me to a fight. And, uh, and then he, he sucker punched me. And I said, I'll be down the park after school. <laughs> <laughs> and, and up until I find this out 40 years later, everybody said, I don't know why he kept, keeps taking, a, taking, you know, taking what he does from, from that kid because he's a punk. And, you know, I stood up to him. I lost the fight, but I stood up to him. And, um, you know, 40 years later, my friends tell me you should have stood up to him a long time earlier. But we did have that, we had that freedom that Freddie talks about. We had the responsibility. We would, we would not bring our problems, um, unless they were really big problems. We wouldn't bring them home to our parents. Um, that was, you dealt with that with your friends. Um, and uh, but also, I think uh, the independence that you enjoyed made you feel that you could accomplish whatever you set your mind to. And I think our parents instill that attitude positive attitude in us, what do you think? No, I, I think one of the best things about going away to college, you know, even though Bridgewater State and, and Stonehill are excellent schools, I think you should go away for college because when you get there, your friends will tell you what a jerk you are for doing the things that your parents told you you're a jerk for doing. <laughs> it's that, you know, that's how you, that's how you learn, that's how you get through life. Yeah. 
Any any parting words, Freddie? No, this has been a good, very nice time. Um, I, I'd like to just shout out to all our classmates that we had growing up. I hope you're all well. Hope you're all safe. Um, and uh, hope to see you in another reunion here pretty soon. Great. Yeah, one of the, maybe the final shout out is a is a it's an Easton story, but it's a classmate story as well. Um, behind me is the entrance to um, Easton Country Club, and one of our classmates, Leon Lombardi, um, his family built owns and and but they built it when we were in eighth grade. His father started it was a dairy farm. His father started a golf course, nine holes, and. Uh, well, Leon has gone on, on to do very, very well. He was a uh, land court judge. He ran for lieutenant governor. Um, just as down home a person today as he was in the, in the eighth grade when, you know, when we met him in junior high school, sixth grade, we probably met him. Um, and, and it's amazing that the town of Easton had a, had a golf team in the 60s. Pretty impressive. Pretty impressive. Okay, well, John Fitzgerald, Fred Almquist, thank you both for coming on my program, Growing Up in Easton. And you have given us unbelievable and unforgettable moments and memories. And so we well, thank you so much. Thank you, but if you haven't figured it out, the two of us could probably keep going for another two hours or so. <laughs> I know, and I have to tell you, yeah. this is, in over an hour that we've been online, but it's, I, I didn't cut it short because it's all so interesting. We're just scratching the surface. Yeah, we, we were so lucky. Yep. Class of 1967, um, just a great bunch of people. <laughs> there it is, Easton in 1967. Yep. Well, thank you both again. Thank and, you. Very and interesting. welcome, okay. and I, I hope that you will encourage some of your class to come on and share their stories on this show growing up in Easton. So, and to our viewing audience, I hope you've enjoyed this program as much as we three have enjoyed presenting it to you. Until next time, be well, stay safe. <laughs>